It's now time to move on to our second speaker. So Dr. Arvind Ramanathan is from the Argon National Lab in Chicago. And he's also a senior scientist at the University of Chicago Consortium for Advanced Science and Engineering. Arvind um, once also hailed from Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon University, where Oles is based. And he received his uh, PhD in computational biology there. And he's since worked at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. He's won many awards, including the prestigious um, ACM Gordon Bell Special Prize for COVID-19 research for his AI-driven multi-scale simulations. And I have a feeling we're gonna hear quite a bit more about um, this particular research in today's seminar. So without further ado, I'm now going to hand the floor over to Dr. Ramanathan for his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. So this is gonna be a perspective on using supercomputers for how we have been developing or discovering small molecules that can aid the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm presenting work that represents more than 400 collaborators. So, you know, it's a lot of uh, material to go, go through in a very short period of time. But if you have questions and things like that, you can always email me or look up my lab address and most of the discussions that we have had would be reflected there. All right. So, I want to start off this talk with a few take home messages. And in particular, what I'm going to stress is that AI and ML approaches can interface with rigorous physics based methods uh, to address modern drug discovery challenges. So I'm going to really speak about two aspects of it, which is, you know, on the virtual screening side, where we can approach speed up of up to a million times. And in the case of deep adaptive simulation techniques to understand the mechanisms of biomolecular uh, systems, um, we can approach 10 power four speed ups. So it's kind of impressive given the fact that, you know, some of these simulations are really hard to do. And I'll explain a little bit about what I mean by that. And the last part is going to deal with, of course, multi-scale modeling and simulation techniques that sort of hold promise for accessing these longer length and time scales, which are traditionally not possible with our simulation techniques. So some of the largest simulations that have been done today are probably uh, in collaboration with uh, Rami Amaro's group where we looked at uh, you know, billion atom systems in which included the entire virus uh, being embedded within a you know, aerosol. But that came up with a lot of challenges when we had to like scale them on these machines and so on. So you know, what I'm going to talk about is how we are interfacing AI and ML approaches in this context. The second aspect of my talk is also going to impose on you know, what we mean by co-design for HPC, where you have AI methods that are interfacing with these rigorous physics-based methods. Um, and the last part is about the SARS-CoV-2 itself, where we'll talk a little bit about how small molecules are discovered. Uh, I know Ole, um, Ole's actually talked a lot about you know, the DFT calculations and the details that go into the design of these molecules at the quantum level. What I'm going to do is about at the virtual screening level and the protein ligand interactions, as well as the protein scale modeling that I think is at a slightly different level than what uh, you know Oles was actually talking about. So with that, um, you know I don't have to introduce the crowd to the SARS-CoV-2 as such. It's the virus that causes COVID-19. Really speaking, it's a fairly large virus. It's about 100 nanometers in diameter. This is actually a figure by one of my collaborators, Tommy Amaro's group, where we were able to render that in sort of molecular details to kind of see what's happening. So the virion is kind of big. And you have a spike trimer uh, protein that's actually the reason why it's called the coronavirus. Uh, it's about 100 copies for virion. Uh, it's about 10 nanometers in length. That also gives you a length scale that we are trying to achieve. The envelope, which is about 20 copies, it's 100 monomers that are present. The nuclear protein, about 1,000 copies, which is probably the most abundant protein inside the system. The membrane protein, about 2,000 copies, uh, very similar to that. But one of the advantages that argon had as a basis was the fact that we had access to these structures that were determined at argon itself. So argon hosts what is called as the um, argon photon source or the advanced photon source, which is actually an X-ray source where you can actually uh, basically take pictures of uh, all these proteins. So a number of these structured and non-structured proteins were actually determined here at the lab that allowed us to have access to this very large scale data set that gave us you know, 
uh, ways to design small molecules. So this is in collaboration with one of our collaborators, Andrew uh, Jopiniak, who is at the lab, and we are actually working with him constantly in trying to find more and more structures that can be targets. So let that let me come into part one of my talk, which is about how we are building AI methods for molecular design. So a lot of the details of how we implemented and things like that are in the different papers. Here you will get to see an overview of different techniques that we have developed and what we are doing. And so if you have any questions, please feel to ask me. So the molecular design pilot was actually something that the entire national lab complex, which consists of 18 national labs in the US, uh, came together and said, okay, we need a way to like address this question of saying, how do we design therapeutics for COVID-19? So we had a number of starting points, as I previously said, we had the crystal structure, we had structural models, and we had multiple antibody templates that we could get from you know, SARS-CoV-1 and the other uh, coronaviruses that are out there. So what we wanted to do was basically use physics-based models that could be accelerated by AI and ML methods to assess what is called as the design fitness. So you really wanna see how can we come up with small molecules that will end up helping us uh, quelling the pandemic in some sense. So as a reason, uh, what was called as the National Virtual Biotechnology Lab was established. And it was basically to aid the US policymakers in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic and accelerate the production of several critical medical supplies throughout the nation. And it specifically embarked on this uh, you know, idea that we should use supercomputing and artificial intelligence techniques for designing uh, therapeutics. And that's kind of a very different stake at which the DOE, the Department of Energy actually started to work. But this also led us to get this US Secretary of Energy Award uh, for recognition of what we did as we brought these supercomputers to work for discovering new therapeutics. And what do we mean by this? If you really look at the chemical space, this is extremely large. It's about 10 power 68. And the drugs that you can actually design are probably much smaller space. And they are very filtered and very specific to the protein of interest that you're targeting. So unfortunately, this makes it extremely complex and extremely expensive. So if, to get a drug into the market, it takes about you know, several billion dollars. And it takes on an average about 10 years, which we don't have with a pandemic like situation like COVID. And brute force was really not an option. If you just integrate these different techniques that you have, it's actually something that you really have to worry about because you're now spending a lot of time just you know, doing virtual screening sort of approaches or you know, uh, doing the sort of extensive calculations that you need to run. And so the idea of using AI-driven HPC methods to you know, effectively accelerate the performance of these simulations was something that was just inevitable. So that's something that we decided to do from the beginning. So in order to do that, we came up with this workflow for drug discovery, which is called as impeccable. Um, I didn't come up with the name as you can say, but you know, the idea behind that was to build this multi-stage campaign that employed the selection of promising drug candidates by employing smarts at different level of this workflow. So the stage one of this, as you can see here, is about high throughput docking. But the high throughput docking is actually coming from a machine learned model that allows us to basically scale up on a large number of these compounds very quickly. And from that, we step into what is called a stage two, which is right here, uh, where we are now doing a rigorous calculation of the binding affinity. But the binding affinity starts out to be somewhat coarse because it's very difficult to do this without appropriate sampling. So this is a place where we use AI techniques to actually uh, enhance the sampling of these, uh, you know, uh, enhance the sampling uh, dysfunction of most of these uh, simulations. And then once you get these improved free energy binding estimates, we get measures of stability and the protein ligand interactions that we think are uh, important and feed that back to our machine learning model in such a way that we can drive this um, you know, optimization cycle many, many times. As far as our implementation was concerned, we actually did not take the cycle through uh, in terms of getting the measures and trying to stabilize it that was done outside because you also need experimental data. But this is something that we started to do from the beginning and we had like good success in terms of running through this model. So the very simple question would be to say, why not dock every compound that's available? 
So that's actually a very fair, straightforward question. So stage one, which is about the high throughput docking I was talking about, it scans about 15,000 ligands per second on all the six GPUs of this machine called Summit, which was at the time the fastest supercomputer that was available. So if you have a library that is about a couple of million compounds or so, it takes about eight hours to compute. And this is just on one receptor, uh, receptor meaning one protein target. But unfortunately, it's just not one target that's sufficient. You have hundreds of targets that you're working with at the same time. This really becomes infeasible because you're now running at much larger scale as to what happens. But in order to actually build something of a smart, we said, okay, why not we use something like a machine learning approach to substitute the docking work that we were doing? And the idea for doing that is fairly simple. Uh, but we needed data for it, right? So we said, okay, why not we make available all of these machine readable data sets for people to work with? So this is actually about 4 billion known molecules that are freely available. You're welcome to download it and try it, but it's all canonicalized. We have computed various features, including the moderate features and other features that people might be interested in. We have computed fingerprints. We have also generated images for them. We can do very fast similarity searches and also use deep learning and other filtering algorithms on top of this data. So this is about uh, 4 billion known molecules that comes from enamine database, the drug bag, binding DB, GDP, e-molecules, zinc-15, a whole bunch of stuff. And we used all of these computing resources, nearly 2 million computing hours actually went into just computing all these features and making the machine readable so that we could actually build our models on top of this. But when you really think of how we applied the machine learning algorithm, it's a very simple idea. So instead of actually docking or predicting the docking post, which essentially means that you're creating a surrogate model for the docking, we said we'll cast it as a regression problem. The idea was to see if a molecule will bind to a given protein target so that we could filter the entire set of compounds that we have in a way that you can actually get the top ranking list. So in some sense, it's basically saying, irrespective of the docking program that you might use, all we want is to find how many compounds can we get from the top ranking list given some training data. So this still uses the same regression problem that what most uh, you know, machine learning models for docking do today. But instead of ranking, we said, we just want to bound how many compounds we need to dock before we start seeing true hits in the data. So this is what is captured by what we call as the RES plot. And this is actually a protein receptor called as PL Pro, where we are looking at the docking surrogate model and trying to see how many of the compounds that we need to look at before we start getting true hits. So this is actually the top Y percent of the ranked computed scores, which means that this is coming from the actual docking program that you care about. And maybe it might be auto dock, it might be dock, it might be any program of your interest, it doesn't really matter. And there is this top X percentage of ranked predicted scores, which is coming from your machine learning model. Again, the machine learning model can be as simple as a you know, multi-layer perceptron or something that uses CNNs on the images because you can actually do rotation invariant formulations, which are quite well optimized. That's actually something that we used here. And if you end up doing that, you can now calculate the percentage of Y percent that is captured by the top X percent. That means that how many of my top ranked compounds that are present in that docking, um, docking simulation are captured by this machine learning model. So if you walk along this particular axis, you can see that for some of them, you actually need to score at least hundreds of compounds to see where the docking score would match with the number of docking uh, calculations that you need to do. And this regression enrichment surface is actually a very easy way to implement and test out various machine learning algorithms to come up with a suggestion of how many compounds you need to look at. So that saves a lot of time in terms of saying, how do we start getting better hits from our data? And if you look at the distribution of time it takes for these computational calculations to take place, this is on the orderable 6.25 million compounds that we had access to at the 32 receptors, there's quite a bit of spread in terms of some of them takes even like 3,600 seconds, right? Quite a large amount of time compared to some of them, which just takes about under 500 seconds to run. So the spread of data is actually kind of important when you actually look at the data, 
But by doing this sort of a machine learning approach, what we were able to do was improve the utilization of the resource that we had. For example, it went up to like 95% of the machine. And we were also able to screen much larger libraries than that is traditionally possible. So for example, we were able to screen like 125 million compounds on 3,850 nodes on this machine called as Frontera, which is at uh, Texas Advanced Computing Center. On Summit using thousand nodes, we were able to like screen 57 million compounds and achieved a utilization of 95%, which is pretty awesome given in how we are able to run these calculations at scale. So this machine learning approach really provides nearly 50,000 X speed up just by using a very simple idea behind it, which is to say, how can I rank the top number of compounds that I'm seeing from the data? So now you got a big, um, you know, um, increase in the teraflops per second that you're able to calculate. So that's like the density of computations that you're doing. And with about 1,536 GPUs, we were able to screen about 319,000 ligands per second, which is really like at the scale of, you know, some of the code that's present in terms of how we can use this. So now this question becomes, how do we expand on the chemical space that we can observe? So this physics-based models are really guided by a certain number of actions, if you really think about it. So you can have some fragments that are added to it, or you can search for a fragment that you want to attach to the molecule, or you do some fingerprint searches, which allows you to say what motifs of these compounds are really good. And you can have like reaction synthesis models that tells you how you synthesize a new molecule or not. So these physics-based molecular simulations allow us to capture this existing structure, model these ligands, and then tell us what sort of observables that we can get from these simulations, which includes the coordinates, the raw trajectories, the experimental data perhaps for some of them where we know that some of them are good inhibitors, some of them are not, and 2D images of these compounds as to where they might be sitting and you know how, my, how we might be able to capture the interactions and so on. And then there are certain rewards that you might want to optimize against, which includes the free energy of interaction, maybe even a rough, free energy interaction like MMGBSA or MMTBSA, docking scores, or RMSD and other metrics that you're seeing. Now you can actually embed this within an ML-driven optimization approach. So sometimes you can also do it with hand optimization methods like neural network scoring functions. And I think Alice and others actually have talked a lot about you know, this thought of uh, scoring functions that they can build or evaluation metrics that they can build, or even expert written approaches, maybe even some algorithm that we know is going to be really cool when it comes to like adding these molecules. So if you were to take this as a cycle, now you can expand on this compound space that is explored by AI. And this was a very simple idea that we said, okay, why don't we use this for designing new molecules that can help us look at them? So now you can actually think of these molecules that are organized in terms of their individual fragments. So you're now starting with these individual fragments and these ligands at the leaf level that you see here on this graph, I'm sorry, this is not very visible, but this is about 6 million compounds that I was talking about before, which is this orderable compounds from MQL data set. And now we have presented this data in a radial format where the nodes are actually fragments or ligands. So the leaf edges are basically full ligands, fully formed ligands. And each of the nodes that are connected to it are the fragments that contribute to forming that particular ligand. And nodes at the leaves give rise to like very tight binders. So each of the nodes are actually like painted by the docking score. So some of them you can see are grayish in color, which means that they don't really bind. You don't get a good value. Some of them are reddish in color, which means that they have like good binding values. Some of them are bluish in color, which means that they're probably, you know, high docking value uh, scores. But as you move along from one uh, fragment to the other, you can see that some addition of fragments lets you get better binding. Uh, for example, from the red to a slightly more red to a slightly darker red and completely red. And sometimes what happens is when you add them, they actually abrogate the binding, which means that the binding scores actually you know, become smaller. So if you use random walk theory or if you use page rank like algorithms, which is something that Google uses all the time, uh, you might be able to dynamically prune this very large space of chemicals into obtaining something that's more relevant for the scores of binding that you're looking at. So really speaking, you're now pruning the chemical space in such a way that you can actually look at it. So we said, does it really work in the real world? So one of the proteins that we took was this protein called as JAK2 kinase. 
And that's actually fragments that are available for looking at what happens. So you have like four or five different fragments, which are the primitives from which you can actually look at them. And you connect all of these compounds together by various combinations of these graphs. So chemical graphs that are just put together. And at each step that you can see, these combinations actually let you increase the total score of binding. And not only do they optimize the binding, they also optimize the interactions with the protein, which is kind of important. So at the end of the day, when you actually like take these four fragments and put them together with the different bonding structures that you see here, you ended up with this ligand called as baricitinib. So it really points out the fact that if you use graph traversal based methods, you should be able to discover good inhibitors for various proteins of interest. So this is something where we use page rank based approaches for looking at strong binding inhibitors of uh, you know, the main protease from the SARS-CoV-2 uh, system. And what is interesting to see is that with respect to these different fragments, we were already getting like decent scores. So for example, you have this molecule, which is one, two, four oxidazole, which is actually having a score of minus 4.98, which is kind of okay. It's not that bad. But when it actually bringing, when it actually gets them together with a molecular fragment, it occupies all the four binding sites and it actually has been an inhibitor for this particular protein, which is kind of cool because it would have been very hard to discover the sort of combinations of molecules that lead to better binding compounds. Now, we ask this question, can we make this something more useful as a machine learning model for actually learning? So this is something, uh, something of an approach where we, use reinforcement learning sort of ideas here. So our expert guided fragment growth is what we call it. So in this case, you have a set of known inhibitors that we know is actually like having an experimental binding affinity to the molecules, and you have a set of known decoys. And the experiment setup was basically to show that we can start with a decoy and basically take it towards a known inhibitor. So you're starting from a decoy molecule, which you know is very similar to a drug, but doesn't bind to the uh, protein of interest. But we said we could take that idea further and see how we could design a new molecule that would end up inhibiting the protein. So what you're going to see here is a movie that depicts the movement of what happens to this ligand as the simulation is running and as we change the different fragments. So in this corner, you will see a little bit of a figure that shows how the compound is changing. And then we'll show the metrics that I talked about in my previous slide about you know, how we were using the coordinates as well as the MMGBSA or PBSA values that we were tracking over the course of this simulation. Okay, so let me play the movie. And this is JAK2 kinase. A lot of known inhibitors do exist. So here is the molecule that starts. So it's actually like now replacing a small fragment of it. And then basically you're looking at the docking score, which was one of the metrics I said, and the uh, MMP GBSA value that tells you the free energy value for that particular uh, drug. And now we are going to replace every fragment and you can actually see how that evol uh, evolves over time. So now we did a basic change. Uh, within three steps, it's starting to come together. And now the docking scores have increased from you know, minus six all the way to like minus 17 in some cases. And then the GBSA is actually going in the right direction where it is actually decreasing. Uh, you saw some more molecules added to it, uh, some more fragments added to it, I'm sorry. And then you can actually see this go up and down, eventually coming to a point where it actually does something very weird. Just wait for it to happen. There you go. So you can see that there is a big jump in energy and then comes back to some sort of a normal value. So as I played this movie, what is important to note is the fact that we are showing you how the protein also responds. For example, the side chains of the arginines and everything that are actually like interacting with the drug, how important it is in terms of like forming those interactions and why we need to do that as part of this entire solution. So this kind of helps us look at ways in which we can uh, sculpt the molecule and you can also place that in the context of VR and things like that, where you, know, you can bring the medical, medicinal chemist in, in terms of augmenting what the human is seeing uh, with the AI-based decisions that it is making. So this is something that is kind of cool for us, but if you were to put that all together, within even like about 25 iterations or so, where we started with the average docking score of about minus five, which is actually on the poorer scale, we were able to quickly optimize it to something about minus 17 or so. And it also leads you to look at the minima in the MMGBSA space that allows us to look at 
you know, by favorable binding forces, favorable binding energies that gives rise to like good pocket structures where we can target these molecules. And because you're now tracking the conformational changes that are there, you can actually see that there are at least three states. So one, two, and three that are marked up here where the conformational states are really favorable for binding. So you can see that the GBSA values are quite low there. And so that's actually an indicator that these points on the you know, landscape are good in terms of like uh, sampling. And it also gives us access to the binding pocket structure that might be good. There's another substate which probably wasted a little bit of time by looking at some things that are not really good for binding. So kind of concludes the story where we could take this workflow and design a new inhibitor for the main protease. So here is one of the predicted structures that we obtained from our docking simulations. And here is the actual experimental compound that was there. Uh, this is published in JSIM and subsequent work has actually resulted in uh, optimizing this compound even further and getting like better hits in terms of their uh, binding ability. Uh, this also shows a room temperature crystal structure, which is kind of important for actually understanding the sort of interactions with the water molecules in the water chains that are present, which is usually not something that you will consider when you're doing a drug discovery study. Most docking programs don't care about the waters. But here is this idea that we could actually track that and we could crystallize the structure and obtain experimental validation for this sort of uh, a study. So in terms of impacting the SARS-CoV-2 medical therapeutics, we actually screened over a thousand compounds which were you know, done using whole cell assays after we did this entire workflow. And we saw about 50 of these compounds actually show viral inhibition activity in, in, in our assays that were performed at uh, Argon. Some of these compounds are still under consideration. They are not crystallized, they're not released to the public yet, but they are there, they are in the process. What I showed you was this initial success that we had with the main protease, but we have other inhibitors that are there in the pipeline for the PL protease, the endoribonuclease, and other molecules that we have been currently working with. Uh, some of the receptor-specific assays are also not existent for some of the proteins, so something that you know, we are still working on. And I didn't touch about the AI-driven antibody design piece of it, but we are also working towards that and probably touch a little bit about this in a small uh, section at the end of my talk if I have time. So the next portion of my talk is going to focus on how we are using AI for multi-scale modeling and simulations. So this actually stemmed from this idea that you know you have various processes of you know complex biological systems, for example, protein folding, where you start with this unfolded structure and reach the folded structure. Uh, people like Anton, I mean people like D. E. Shaw have built a machine called as Anton for just doing this sort of simulations where you can run very large, um, long time scale simulations on fairly medium sized systems. Or you wanna study how a drug actually binds to a small uh, protein like the propane like protease that's shown here. Or you might actually be doing something even more ambitious where you're now trying to understand how this particular virus that is embedded within this variant, uh, embedded within this uh, you know, aerosol, gives rise to dynamic behaviors that's possibly going to explain how the virus actually spreads. So when you have these many atom multi-scale systems, these large dynamics are very hard to study. In fact, this is a part of the study that I'm going to present a little bit about how we actually modified our existing approaches to accelerate uh, some of these tools. So if you look at the standard simulation approaches and how we think of, you know, um, these simulations, they face a lot of data movement and parallel analytics challenges. So technically what used to happen was you had a job scheduler, you submit your simulation, you store the data, you run the analytics, you visualize the data and sort of understand what's going on. So this will usually take a span of like four to six years. Exactly what happened during my PhD year. So is exactly the sort of workflow that we had to implement and do the sort of simulations and wait for it to run. And you don't even know if it is actually like doing the right thing in the first place. But large simulations generate a lot of data. So some of them actually have like terabytes of data, 100 terabytes of data, which means that you're just not humanly possible to peek into this biologically relevant information and identify what you're doing. So one way to get rid of this problem is to say, let's run the analysis as the simulation or run. So in te technical terms, it's what is referred to as in situ analysis. So where you can actually reduce the amount of data that you have to move between the simulation place and where the analysis is getting done. 
and you sort of provide online monitoring and feedback for the simulation as it is running. So in order to implement that, we went with something called as the Ensemble Toolkit Workflow, which is implemented using what is called as a radical cyber tools workflow system. And I'll point you to that uh, in the end of the talk, but this idea was very simple. You have a pipeline of these simulations that are running. So you have 120 simulations that are running. You basically exchange some data, which allows you to collect the information that you want. And you run your training algorithm, maybe a standard machine learning algorithm, which is not deep learning, or it can be a deep learning algorithm. That kind of brings about different uh, aspects of, you know, how do you schedule these jobs and work with them and so on. But you infer from the machine learning algorithm to say, do you need more training data or do you need to start new simulations? So this sort of builds upon this idea of deep adaptive simulations that you can do. And here is this uh, thing that we started to do with AI enabled MD simulations where you have ensembles of molecular dynamic simulations where in integrating the infant fossil motion and trying to obtain these simulations that are running. And you're collecting the data which includes the XYZ positions that are varying over time. And you feed all of that coordinates, contact maps or other features that you're actually like getting from the raw data into a deep learning or AI tools, which allows us to build physically interpretable embeddings and once you have these reaction coordinates that are learned in this low dimensional space, you use that idea to understand what states are being sampled more often. And if you have some interesting confirmations from which you saw things that were not happening, for example, in this case, this is a spike protein head. And the spike protein head was started off with the closed state where you can see this blue region where the uh, receptor binding domain is pretty much closed. But in some cases it might start to open and those are the interesting confirmations from which you want to continue running these simulations. So you can continue those simulations, but the deep learning or the AI method keeps learning uh, from the data in a continuous manner, which allows you to like really push hard on the sampling uh, part of these simulations. But in order to do this, it requires a little bit of work. So from a supercomputing perspective, you have all these simulations that are running. And you have this aggregation of data that has to happen on a continuous manner. So you can stream the data to the training as well as stream the data to the inference. So you sort of have these two way street of saying, how do you channel the data? And then once you learn on that data, you also want to make sure that you get the recent uh, information into it so that you can now drive new startup of these simulations. So there is this aspect of getting these uh, execution of these tasks to be complete but also have them run and stop in uh, different ways. You have parallelism that you need to deal with because you have heterogeneous components that allow for you know, how these simulations are run. Some simulations are more uh, CPU heavy, some simulations are less CPU heavy. And then you have to manage the communication between the different components that are needed to minimize the file, of, file system overhead. So what happens when I use my machine learning algorithm that's combined with this data stream? So here are these three scenarios where we are measuring the root mean square deviation. Typically in a folding simulation, you really care about a root mean square deviation, which tells you from the folded state, how far away it is or how much it has to actually fold. So this is a measure of the average distance in terms of the uh, structure. And this gives you an idea of how well the folded structure is. So A is actually a very simple outlier detection that basically tells you that there's no biophysical selection criteria that's happening. But that's unfortunately stagnant in terms of where it is sampling. It's not doing anything. It's basically like struggling to actually cope up with the data and doesn't do anything in terms of you know, folding. The second scenario is when you can actually select the confirmers that have the minimal root mean square deviation, but it actually doesn't come to a point where it gets it, it starts to become stagnant at a much later stage in the workflow, which is kind of interesting to see that over the course of the simulation, we sample close to like two angstroms or so, but there is only one that actually reaches something that is very close to the folded state where you get RMSDs of less than two angstroms. And this is actually where we combine the biophysics with these sorts of uh, uh, you know, latent space embeddings that we learn. Sort of various ways in which you can build latent space. I'm not going to go into that detail. We have shown that there are at least like six or seven types of uh, auto encoders that you can build for this data. You take the coordinates, embed them into this low dimensional space and sample from that. And you basically get this um, embedding from which you can start new simulations from. 
And this is what we did in terms of our simulations. And actually the story is that, you know, if you use the machine learning based model along with biophysically relevant parameters, you actually end up folding up the protein much faster. How fast is the question, right? So now what we are showing to you is this big plot it takes a little bit of time to understand. So this is actually the physical time of the simulation. So microseconds of simulations that were carried out and the sampling ratio that basically measures the amount of states that were seen in our simulations. And that's actually a quantity that's uh, usually determined by something called as Markov state models. And we basically make sure that all of these simulations are in the same uh, space to continue to uh, you know, uh, look at them. So the uh, MD simulations for this particular protein, which is FSDEY, it's the beta beta alpha fold. Uh, we have two trajectories from Anton, which are shown in green color here. There are two other MD simulations that were not done with anything other than just, just plain MD and trying to see whether they'll fold. And then you have the deep drive MD with various approaches. So you just have the machine learning, but no RMSD value was used in terms of determining the outliers. You have, the machine, you have no machine learning, but you just select the states on the basis of the greedy RMSD algorithm. Or you have the deep drive MD, which actually uses both the machine learning and the RMSD. And no doubt deep drive MD actually wins hands down, which is good. And if you just look at the 80% line and look at what Anton has done, it takes about several hundreds of microseconds for it to sample. Whereas within a course of like several nanoseconds, we actually reach that sort of 80% coverage. And what I want you to observe is that the machine learning takes a sort of steep curve in terms of very quickly understanding what those states that might be relevant for it. But it also saturates here. At some point beyond that 80%, it starts to saturate and it's not improving its quality. That's also because there might be some issues with overtraining our algorithm and so on. But the important thing to point is that, you know, if you just compare the 80% line with respect to where the Anton simulations are, easily you see a four order magnitude speed up that we get just by doing something which is very simple, a very simple machine learning algorithm that's been combined with a biophysically relevant value. And now we repeated this experiment 10 times to kind of say that, okay, we are quite confident in terms of how we get our result. In some cases, the speed up is larger. We can actually like even get 10 power five speed up, or in some cases it might be slower, but on an average, it's about 10 power four, which I think is quite cool from the sort of speed ups that we see. But now you have a problem because machine learning algorithms that are typically based on uh, deep learning methods are quite parameter heavy. So, you know, you start with these MD simulations, you have these input contact matrices that can be quite large. For example, the spike protein is typically thousands of residues, which means that it's a thousand by thousand input contact matrix, which means that the number of parameters that you have to use for these convolution filters can expand quite a lot. And as a consequence, when you're doing the clustering and things like that for tracking confirmational states, it becomes extremely hard to do this. So if you have to do representation of these contact maps as sparse matrices, the number of parameters that you require for training is about a billion. So it's order of 10 power 12, which makes it extremely hard to train. So we needed to come up with a shortcut to help us address that question. So this is where adversarial methods actually make a lot of sense. So the adversarial autoencoders was actually something that we built for the particular application that I was talking about, which was the spike head protein simulations. So the idea is fairly simple. You still have the typical encoder decoder sort of architecture, which uses the uh, autoencoder sort of an idea, but you can work with point cloud representation. And the adversarial autoencoder basically uses this sort of a prior that informs us about a discriminator that tells us whether this structure that is generated was actually unique enough that we should use it or not. So instead of dealing with about 10 power 12 parameters, which is a billion parameters, it only has about 10,000 parameters. So now the problem that we actually were solving in this very large contact space is now reduced to this very small number of parameters that we need to train, which makes it much more efficient. So how efficient is it? So deep drive MD actually does quite well. So the me memory performance, if you were to use this variational autoencoder that I was talking to you about before, um, it is about uh, O of N squared in terms of the amount of memory it requires. So if you were to do the spike monomer, spike dimer, and spike trimer, uh, very easily we'll over overwhelm the memory of the system. On the other hand, the memory consumption of this adversarial autoencoder is pretty stable and it's sort of linear. 
And in the same way, you can actually see that for what happens with the uh, training time per epoch also, whereas it stays more or less constant for the adversarial autoencoder, it's actually like, uh, you know, uh, quadratic in terms of amount of train, uh, amount of time it takes to train the same algorithm. So we can scale to much larger protein sizes and it's far more efficient in terms of training. So this almost constant cost of training time and better scaling actually allows us to do something for the spike protein where you, know, you can actually learn a latent space that kind of spans this uh, you know, as the simulations are running. So now each of the simulation points are shown as a dot and that latent space is actually clustered using TSNE. Of course, TSNE is one method to do it. There are various approaches in doing this, but one of the snapshots I'm showing you right there is this blue ball where you can actually see that, you know, the entire detail of the spike protein is present. The RBD is actually in a closed state, right? So it's in the closed state. But now let me play another movie where you can actually see this entire thing now combined and ultimately it reaches a point where it's actually like completely open. So you can actually see this where it completely opens up and the spike protein is actually sampled uh, within the course of these learned simulations. So now what we can do is ask questions of actually transferring what happens when it is uh, complex with this ACE2 receptor. So here is a movie that kind of depicts what happens when the ACE2 receptor is bound it actually ends up moving the stock areas of the protein quite a bit. And that's actually kind of interesting because something we did not really expect in terms of the training was that it was only trained on the spike head region when we started, but it's now starting to detect motions in other regions of the protein. It's learning those motions on the fly, which is kind of cool for you know, how a deep learning algorithm really works. So in this case, we are now showing a region where it's actually like completely twisted and that has important implications for just understanding how the spike protein and the AS2 might interact. So in terms of the effective scientific performance, if you just think of the spike protein as this huge uh, flower-like structure that's shown here with the hip, the knee, and the ankle regions, and we actually track them. I'm just showing you the knee and the hip regions. So when we were doing this very long timescale simulations for about 500 nanoseconds or, or so without deep drive MD, they were able to sample only about 30 degrees uh, in terms of the overall motion. But within just 0 0.06 microseconds of simulations, which is about 60 nanoseconds of this guided uh, AI guided simulations, we were now able to push this even further to about 45 degrees in terms of the uh, bend that we were observing. That's kind of cool because it lets us sample about 25% more conservations of the knee bending with just 12% of the time. Right, So that's kind of ability to scale up on much larger systems in terms of how we learn to do it on uh, the spike protein, which is a very challenging system to study. And without the amount of sampling that you wanted to do, if you just ran an MD simulation, you would just see this thing just standing like a rock. And now with the AI-based methods, we are able to like push it beyond the borders of saying, okay, it can actually bend. It has like um, experimental data that can also confirm that these bends are actually like physically viable. So now let me get into the other portion where we are doing multi-scale really in terms of the multi-scale ideas. So here is this thing where we are looking at the virus life cycle. So the coronavirus attaches itself to your human cell, for example. And after it atta attaches itself to the human cell by the ACE2 receptor, which is what we were studying thus far, uh, it releases its genetic material inside the cell. And once it releases the genetic material, this is now transcribed by the host uh, ribosome, uh, which, which is what is shown here, to actually produce all of the proteins that the proteome encodes. And all of these proteins that are encoded now form what is called as a replication transcription complex, which is a fairly large complex within the system. So this is a fairly large photocopier of the cell, uh, viral cell basically, and it tries to like make copies of its RNA. And what it is composed of is this very large complex of various uh, components, which keeps pushing the DNA material to produce more and more virus. So the idea was if you were to stop this uh, replication transcription complex from functioning, we could actually get to a point where we can treat the disease as such. But the replication transcription complex, as I said, uh, it's a fairly large complex consisting of all these non-structural proteins that are complex together. And you have to actually study 
how the RNA unwinds in order for the RNA to get transcribed into its uh, original uh, structure, how it gets copied basically. So the idea behind this was now that we had access to cryo-EM data, albeit low restitution data, but somehow we wanted to move that into all atom simulations where we could actually study all of the conformations that might be present or that might be represented in the cryo data. But unfortunately, that's a very hard problem. And that's where we actually said, okay, we need an intermediate representation that allows us to take these uh, density representations into something that's more feasible for all atom simulations. So that's guided by uh, AI. So the AI method actually starts with these sorts of, you know, images that we get from the, um, you know, cryo EM data that's placed on a grid, and we build something called a fly, uh, fluctuating finite element analysis with a collaborator at UK, uh, Sarah, Le uh, Sarah, uh, Sarah Harris from the University of Leeds. And now we can actually use custom meshing for cryo EM data and build finite element models of these protein structures. And what it allows us to do is basically build a hierarchical AI approach that learns from these local atomistic fluctuations in all atom in these simulations, transfers these parameters back to the FFEA mesh, and then learn these global fluctuations in such a way that we can guide the sampling that we just saw. So in, in the deep drive MD case where we were looking at just sampling the all atom simulations and pushing them forward, we were now able to do something more, which is that we are able to learn these global fluctuations and pass them back to the experimental data in such a way that we can capture some of the quantities that we might have missed or some of the states that we might have missed from the simulations. So what is this fluctuating finite element methodology? It's basically uh, a representation of proteins as viscoelastic continuum solids. Uh, it uses a 612 Leonard Jones potential with a poten repulsive potential that is proportional to the overlapping volumes. So you are really thinking of it as blobs uh, instead of really looking at them as atoms and atoms that are connected. And these are now tetrahedral elements that are just computed from uh, all atom simulations. And these can be pre-computed from our all atom MD simulations. And eventually what it allows you to do is basically estimate the harmonic restraints and things that you need. And the physics is evaluated over the tetrahedral elements. And this is basically Newton's laws of motion uh, where you are measuring the change in the velocity for each of these faces and the elements that you're looking at with respect to the density that you have captured. And you have the viscous stress, the elastic stress and an additional parameter, what is called as a thermal noise that we add because there is natural fluctuations in these boundaries that you can use. And there might be an external force that you apply on the system that's coming from solvent or that's coming from all atom simulations in terms of these harmonic restraints that we talk about. And you can basically run these simulations at any scale that you want. But when Sarah runs these simulations, see, she only has access to this Leonard Jones potential. The rest of it has to be fed back from the all atom simulations that we were doing. And that's actually something that we implemented using a hierarchy of uh, MD, I mean, hierarchy of AI approaches. But before that, the all atom simulations themselves had to be scaled on, you know, what are called as the DGX A100 machines, which are basically uh, NVIDIA machines, which have like an AMD processor connected to eight A100 uh, GPUs. So on these machines, we could actually get to a point where we can accelerate the sampling of a 1.1 million atoms and obtain about 64 nanoseconds per day uh, performance. And with a 2.2 million atom RTC, we can actually get to about 32 uh, nanoseconds per day. And now the reason you actually see this sort of behavior is the fact that it's coming from the PME limit scalability in terms of how these machines are implemented and how we have to accelerate them on these very dense nodes that we are looking at. And in terms of the hierarchical AI approaches, we actually build something that could capture the global and local uh, fluctuations that we are observing. So you're now coupling FFEA simulations with all atom MD simulations. So we had to build something called this unharmonic confirmation analysis enabled autoencoders, which captures these global RTC scale fluctuations from the FFEA simulations. Use that and encode them using variational autoencoders, but any one of the variational autoencoders are fine, but we use the adversarial autoencoder in this case. You identify the confirmation states that have been sampled by each of the subunits so that you can actually input them back into these all atom simulations. 
And finally, you also have a graph neural operator that allows you to surrogate the MD simulations at very short time scales in order to obtain these late space representations that allows us to capture the fluctuations. So now you can see that there are like hierarchy of machine learning codes that have to come together along with these sorts of simulations. That's where the speciality of this workflow kind of becomes important. So how do you coordinate all these learning and uh, you know, HPC simulation jobs at the same time becomes a problem. But one aspect that I want to talk about is how do we scale this variational autoencoders when you have proteins that have various sizes uh, that are present in this particular sample. So as I showed you before, some of these proteins are like thousand residues long. Some of the proteins are only like 25 residues. Some of the proteins are like hundreds of residues. So you need to worry about the size and the mismatch in shape of the, you know, how we run these simulations. As a consequence, uh, we had to resort to training these algorithms on something called as Cerebrus CS2, which is a specialized chip for training uh, just AI-based methods or deep learning methods. So the AI-based methods were accelerated on the Cerebrus chip. And one, one of the things that we saw is with about 500 residues or so, it matches up a system that has about eight GPUs. And that's kind of cool because it allows you to like look at um, systems where you can actually scale it to much larger number of GPUs on a system like Summit. So the thing is that the Summit is not the best GPUs in the world because they only have a V100 GPU. But with eight, uh, you know, A100 GPUs, we were able to achieve the same result in terms of training the same uh, network. But a single Cerebrus chip, which is one of the largest chips ever built on this planet, uh, we were able to get results that were out of the box performance, which are optimized for, you know, these type, sort of systems. We were able to like push sample sizes of about 24,000. So there's really like pushes on the uh, ability to pump in a lot of data and train the algorithms to obtain uh, same amount of results for you know investing uh, in a little bit of a specialized system for doing AI. So now you have this ability to like offload the AI training to specialized chips, but onload the simulations onto these GPUs where they really run. And you can optimize the amount of resources that you need for your training versus HPC jobs. So in order to implement this, we use something called as Balsam, uh, distributed workflow infrastructure. So this actually couples two or more supercomputing sites. So Perlmutter is located in Berkeley, uh, which is part of the NERSC supercomputing center. And Theta GPU is actually the Argon leadership computing facility machine. And it allows us to take into account how we run these jobs on multiple sites at the same time. Uh, it has intelligent agents that scale to multiple ensembles. Uh, it maintains asynchronous data flow, so you really are not troubled by how much data needs to be transferred. It's fault tolerant. It also manages migratable uh, you know, execution and allows you to uh, scale elastically across the machine. So by taking this entire approach, we were now able to like combine the data from multiple sources, and you can actually see the all-atom representation of you know, the FFEA simulations that we learned and push them together in terms of how we could run these simulations at scale. So, you know, this is showing the all atom MD simulation as it is equilibrating over the course of several microseconds. And once you do that, you can actually unwind the RNA by taking it from one site to another. So here is this thing where it is moving from one active site and moving all the way to the NSP14, where important steps of the RNA uh, activity actually take place. And that's actually kind of cool to see the sort of simulations come together for driving them. And eventually to a point where we can actually take them back into the FFEA simulation, where we learn the parameters for what constitutes good uh, interaction energies between protein-protein interfaces. So you can actually study more of these long time scale and larger length scale of these simulations automatically without ever having to like understand how exactly FFEA might work in the intricacy. So that kind of allows us to bridge the gap from experimental data in terms of substates that we might have not seen at all. And that's kind of cool because eventually you want to observe these motions in the context of the experimental data. So you want to interpret the experimental data appropriately. This allows us to do uh, one step further. Why are we doing all of this stuff? Uh, as Alice was mentioning, there were uh, chemicals that you could actually screen in an automated fashion. 
uh, we are interested in antimicrobial design where we have designed this uh, entire lab that's actually an automated lab where code is the way you're actually starting to write experiments. So code will actually like control how the experiments are running. So we have these large language models um, that produce these experimental, uh, I mean, uh, peptides that look like antimicrobials. We can actually synthesize them inside the lab automatically using what is called as a peptide synthesizer. It is basically an ice uh, swing machine that's present in the lab. We get these wires and we can actually do the experiments automated inside the lab. So this is actually a robot that runs this experiment. It's integrated with a plate incubator as well as a plate reader that kind of gives us ideas on how we should screen for these data sets. And once the AI models actually learn these features from the current experiment, it constrains the generation of AMP at every cycle. But we also use the simulations as a surrogate for like accelerating how we are studying these simulations. I mean, how we are studying these antimicrobial action on these data sets. So this is like a complete workflow where AI controls all of the steps from experimental design, all the way to execution, all the way to like designing new antimicrobials for species that we might have not seen or bacteria that we might have not seen. So that's something that we're currently working on and very excited about. And then I would like to thank all my team members that were part of the study. Uh, it includes like more than several countries. So, you know, uh, listing all of them here. Uh, but with that, you know, I need to thank people for the computing time also, because uh, it gave us quite a bit of computing time on these large systems. And what I've summarized to you is a goal of how we are thinking of AI and ML in the context of supercomputing applications, especially for molecular design and understanding the mechanistic details of how proteins function. Uh, there are many challenges, especially towards automating experiments using what are called as optimal design strategies. Uh, you want to get the most information out of the smallest number of experiments that you want to do. That's actually optimal design strategy for experimental design. Uh, you want to have ease of use and interpretability, which is still a major challenge as to, you know, we don't understand why these machine learning techniques work the way they do, especially in the context of this. We need better ways to integrate uh, them on emerging hardware platforms, which is also something that they're currently working on. And if you're interested in the software and you would like to try it out, you know, you, you can go to these websites and you can actually get them. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Arvin. That was a really interesting talk. Um, we've got time just for a few questions and I might just ask the first one. I was, I was really interested in this deep drive MD approach of, of sort of pushing the simulations to sample new areas. Um, mm -hmm. But is it possible from that simulation to sort of go backwards and reweight the simulations to work out the, the relative probability of all those different confirmations and states that you've sampled? Yeah, great question. I think, yes, that is possible. That's something that we're currently <coughs> working on uh, in terms of correcting for the weights and how we are doing it. So. You know, uh, Cecilia and Frank know you have various techniques that they have implemented. And it, I think it's very complementary to the same approaches. Um, it's just that our latent space representation kind of is, uh, you know, uh, accounts of both linear and nonlinear fluctuations. And so that's kind of capturing the reaction coordinates in a uh, interesting manner. So you see this sort of behavior that comes, up for, uh, com comes about. Uh, in identifying these reaction coordinates. So yes, definitely do. We are working on that. Yeah, and in the, the first example you gave, you, you sort of knew one reaction coordinate of interest, which was the RMSD to the folded state, but you don't, am I correct that you don't, you don't need to know in advance what the reaction coordinate will be? Yeah, we don't need to at all. This is completely unsupervised. I just showed you with the RMSD <clears throat> plots because it's easy for people to understand as to what mm -hmm. happens but they, they can be completely unsupervised. Um, uh, we have shown time and again on these uh, spike protein simulations that yes, it is possible for it to be completely unsupervised. We end up getting uh, you know, uh, sampling of these open states uh, starting from a completely closed state. And uh, usually it takes about several, several microseconds for them to open up. But that active sampling actually achieves that within a couple of uh, hundred nanoseconds or so really speaking. Okay. I have a question from Fred who was asking about the, the last section. He was asking how, how many tetrahedral elements were used and are they linear or higher order elements? 
Great question. So mostly a question for Sarah, but I can tell you that most of them that we were using. So the finite element code that we are using is not a standard uh, finite element code that we are using, unfortunately. That's because of this extra physics that was added to it with respect to the uh, fluctuating elements. So, you know, uh, it's sort of this idea that we needed uh, more uh, uh, non-linear elements added to it. And so uh, exact number I think is in the paper. I don't recall the exact number, but it's there. Okay, and I might ask you just one more question before we move on, which is um, back to the, the first part on this um, fragment growth simulation that you showed. That sure. was a really cool simulation. I, I enjoyed watching that. Thank you. Um, yeah. The different conformations of the ligand that we saw in the protein, are they coming from um, different docked poses or were you actually running an MD step? Um, no, we are running an MD step. It's mm -hmm. actually dynamic. So it's yeah. really like running the MD step as we are running the uh, GBSA simulations mm -hmm. or the MMPBSA simulation. It really depends on where it goes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was amazed at the speed that you were getting if you were doing MD and the MMGBSA at, at each phase. Potentially, that's also because it's parallelized across multiple nodes, really speaking. Mm -hmm. So you can you can have like several spawns of these simulations that are running and very quickly occupy an entire machine if you want. But, you know, in this particular case, we limit ourselves to having a smaller number of nodes on which we are running. So we limit ourselves in that sense. Okay, we're gonna have one last question before we move on, which is from Johannes, who was asking about the antimicrobial approach. Mm -hmm. Do you have a selectivity criteria against mammalian cells, excluding peptides, which are going to be active against mammalian membranes? Yeah, great question. I don't <clears throat> think so, but not right now. Uh, I think we need to include those aspects in terms of the biological importance and what we are learning from this uh, story. Uh, hopefully in subsequent rounds of this, hopefully the experiment itself or you know, how we are running our simulations itself is going to learn as to what's happening. So we are now collaborating with Saima Khalid at uh, Oxford University, where they have like much better models for, you know, uh, selectivity criteria against mammalian cells, which are coming from simulations and also like understanding the complexity of the membranes and so on. And uh, some aspects of lipidomics that we don't understand from bacteria at all. And it's kind of crazy that even after so many years, we don't understand the organizational aspects of how bacterial membranes are put together. And only now there are like studies that are showing how important it is to know before we actually target them. So yeah, we'll have to see. Great. Well, thank you again. I think we better move on, but thanks for that excellent talk. It was yeah, really interesting. Thank you.